three, two. Hey, everybody. Dr. Dusa here, MTFU Longevity Podcast. How are you? We're here with, finally, George Betancourt. Took a yeah. while to get him. Get, he's a busy, busy guy. And, but people, really, they honor me and us with their time. People are busy. You know, many of you know George as probably the best teenage bodybuilder ever. In fact, not only did he win the overall Teen USA in 1989, he won the overall Teen Nationals in 1990. I don't know if that's ever been done. I'd have to research that a little. But, you know, that's over two years. So, you know, he won it when he was 18. He said, let me come back and win the other one when he was 19. But, you know, again, George had one of those physiques, still has a good physique, but he was like a combination of Frank Zane and Francis Benfato and John Torilli and, you know, just a mixture and uh, we're going to talk about, you know, he, he did well and then he left bodybuilding and maybe he's, he sometimes wonders how far he could have went. But of course, he started a very successful supplement company, uh, which he sold. And But we can learn a lot from him because he's still in great shape uh, at the age of 48 and um, 48. Yep, I'm not going to I'm not going to make a mistake on that one. It looks looks, you know, if he was my patient, I was writing in a chart, I'd say patient appears much younger than stated age. And he's a father of two, married. Where are you in Florida, George? Where about? I'm in uh, Miami, Coral Gables. Oh, very nice. Very nice. All right. So starting out, um, we talked a little bit, but, you know, everybody has a story as to how they started training and, and why they started training. And of course, back then, yep. it wasn't the same as it is now. It wasn't so popular. So you came from Puerto Rico with your parents at age eight. Correct. Correct. Um, 1980, New Year's Eve, we moved here. So 79 going into 1980, it's when I moved here. And now thanks why, for having me on the show. Well, no, it's, it's our honor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, why did your parents come? They want to have a better life or they just... Uh... Um, Michael, um, I, I was too young, so I can't really put the pieces together. I, I believe um, my father, the, the business that he worked for um, had gone under and he always wanted to live in America. And, and, per, and Puerto Rico during those times, um, the economy started shifting um, and not doing too well. Uh, he saw it coming, and he just thought he his dream um, was always to move here to the U.S. He thought there was more opportunities here. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and you, you were telling me you spoke no English when you came here at AJ. No, um, I spoke no English, and like I was telling you prior, when I moved here, um, the kids were very mean to me uh, because uh, my language, I couldn't pronounce certain words and they just sounded funny. And there weren't too many Latin people here in Miami when I moved. It was the beginning. It, it was right right after the, you know, when Fidel Castro let in the Mariel into right. Miami. And and if you didn't speak English, the, the kids from here would, you know, they would, you know, out, outcast you. Would they bully you or uh, beat on you or anything like that, or wasn't that bad? I could see that. I could see that easily happening, but I, 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 I always, like I was telling you, I always had a chip on my shoulder. I was a, I was kind of a tough kid, um, I, due to my cousins. You know, when I was in Puerto Rico, like my cousins would put me to fight with other kids. It was just really? crazy. You know, yeah, they were older. You know, they were. They were 16 and I was eight, and they would just put me, hey, go fight this kid, and I will go fight the kid. You know, it was just kind of like a uh, fight club or something like that. Well, yeah, I, I, not, I wasn't a good fighter, but I. Uh, I well, you know, uh, if, if it makes it any better, my parents used to send me to stay with my cousins part of the summer, and they were older, and they used to hide in trees, and I'd be walking, they'd just jump on me out, out of the blue right. and try to make me talk. Yeah, yeah. It didn't, yeah. I don't think it worked, but it, 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 wasn't, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so when these kids would, you know, make fun of my language at the time, I, I would, you know, I would, they were asking, they were asking me, where are you from? And and I, they didn't like Puerto Ricans. And instead of hiding it, I'm like, I'm from Puerto Rico, you know? Like, Good. like, like you know, I would spit it back on their face, you know, like to see what they were going to do. And, and you know, I, I was good defending myself and I got through it. I got through that way. That had to just be dialed into your your character, your personage. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have two older two older brothers, um, fifty six and fifty four. All right, they're around my uh, rarefied era of age. That's good, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to know there's still, you know, you know, the older you get, the less people there are ahead of you, you know. And <laughs> more, more behind. It's kind of a nutty way to think. All right, so 
so you're there, you're in school and you played sports. You want to be a baseball player, right? Yeah, I wanted to be a baseball player when I was a kid. And, and you know, every kid's dream is to become, you know, an athlete or whatever. And uh, but when I when my mom signed me up in baseball here, I didn't speak English. So at a shyness, I would sit on the corner of the bench because the kids wouldn't want to speak with me, you know, because I didn't speak their language. So I dropped out of that. Um, and 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 one of the, um, what I would say one of the reasons why I got into bodybuilding, um, or what got me into bodybuilding, I used to see my father in Puerto Rico. Uh, he wasn't a weightlifter by any means, but he used to try to stay fit. And in Puerto Rico, the, the rooftops are flat. And in in some homes, you're able to keep your access, you know, the, the, instead of being a garage, like a garage, like we have a garage door here, you will keep your access inventory, your access junk on top of the roof. Really? And, uh, yeah. So wow. my so my father had a, a bench up there, a bench, and those plastic weights, I imagine. Of course. And again, I'm eight years old. And I used to see my father, like, go up a ladder and go up there and do something, you know. And I remember one day asking him, and he says, I'm exercising. And then, um, and, and then one day, so that always stayed in my mind, like, what, the heck, what is he doing there? So I, I, I thought that that was part of being a man, like, exercising. It's not that you have to do it, but I, I thought that being a man meant you had to have muscles, you know? Was your, was your father in decent shape? Do you remember? Yeah, you my remember? father. Yeah, but not bodybuilding wise. Right. My right. father always either, either, my father always did some type of exercise, whether it's walking 20 miles or, or jogging a little bit. I think as he, as he, he used to jog a little bit, but I think his knees started bothering him. As he got older, he would just walk on the beach, you know, 20, 30 miles, you know? And yeah, then, he, well, and then uh, his building, he had some weights, and he would lift weights there, but not bodybuilding again. He was very proud of me when he saw me compete. But oh, I, I, I we'll, that, we'll get to that. That's important. Yeah. What was? What was well, I'm sorry. Go ahead, George. Go ahead. No, I was. I wanted to tell you two other things that changed my life at a young age. Was um, my father? It, it, I'm not going to tell you changed my 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 life, but it it impacted my my mind and it stayed engraved on my mind when I, when I was a kid maybe eight, they had the Pan American Games um, in Puerto Rico. And my father took me to see the Olympic lifting. Wow. When I was eight years old. And that that always stayed engraved on my on my head. I had no clue what they were doing. Um, I, and I guess, actually, I got scared because the first guy went up. And I do not know if he dropped the weight or if he couldn't push it up. But I remember he screamed like he let go of it. So it kind of scared me, you know. It wasn't like it George, made a George. You were almost hitting a double bicep right there. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay. I, so you remember, I you remember, you remember that correct. clearly. No, I still got the muscles. No, <laughs> you know, you look good, man. <laughs> so the weight goes behind him, and he screams. I'm eight years old. I don't know if that's good or bad, you know. But it it, it scared me. And then the third piece. My father one day takes me to the beach. In Puerto Rico, and I'm walk. We're walking on the street, trying um, walking towards the beach, and I seen for the first time. I seen two guys that look like superheroes, and I do not know if they were bodybuilders or if they were wrestlers, like American wrestlers that had traveled right. to Puerto Rico to wrestle for right. some type of event. But they were tall, some type of long hair. They just look like savage, like. Um, <laughs> Like they, Conan, they, they, you know. In other, words, it, you didn't, in other words, that's not what you would normally see. No, 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 no. no. It, it, it just looked like right very. I will interrupt for these comments for the people who visit and they're here, all here to talk to you and see you. Dave, David Bachman, a great member, says George, Frank Zane, Bob Paris, and Rory Liedelmeyer, all reminiscent of you, uh, had the aesthetic lines and bodies that I liked when I got into bodybuilding. What'd you think of those three guys? Zane, Paris, and Liedelmeyer, when you saw their bodies, I mean, obviously you ended up looking how you look, but did you kind of aspire to look like those guys? Yeah, the first time I saw Lyndon Murray, um, it wasn't even in a magazine. I went to my best friend's house. His name is Frankie Same, not Zane, the Same. And um, he had an autograph picture of him, and he showed it to me, and I was mesmerized by it. And I, I just remember, like, how do you get like that? And and he he definitely had a beautiful physique and something to inspire you to. Um, 
Frank Zane. It's amazing, you know, those black and white pictures with his, when you know, doing sucking his rib cage oh, yeah. in and, and with his hands. Just all those physiques were, were amazing. Frank Zane, and who's the third one you said? Uh, let's see. Uh, we had Paris, Zane, and Lito. Oh, and Paris, forget it, you know. I mean, what, what can you say, you know? It's, 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 it's beauty, man, you know. Like, I used to look at bodybuilding, especially. Like, so Bob Paris, I learned a few years after Linda Murray. Um, but pa Paris was like a, like a, like a, sculptor piece of work you know like art you know and, and i would look at it i used to draw before i got into bodybuilding so i used to draw com like comics and i used to do graffiti so when really? i start seeing yeah 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 so, so when george, i start george, george the legal kind or no illegal illegal okay good <laughs> so good <laughs> so my brother my brother is actually a famous artist my father my brother really? sells yeah he sells paintings for 40 50 60 thousand dollars wow. he's in okay. he's in museums so I, there's a lot of art in my family, and my uh, so my brother taught me the basics of you know of drawing and stuff like that. So when I saw Bob Paris, Bob Paris was like a sculpture. And so so to me, it was like what I was drawing. It just reminded me of what I was drawing on paper, you know, like these shapes of, of the human body. And and Bob Paris, Bob Paris had that, you know. George, you know, it's interesting to say it, especially mentioning Frank Zane. I've done some work with Frank, and we were talking once. And I, I asked them, and this I'll pose this to you, especially with the artistic bent that you just mentioned. I said to Frank, you know, is bodybuilding an art or a sport? And he said, you know, I think it's more of an art. The training is athletic, but the actual presentation, you know, I'm creating, I'm yeah. creating an art. That's what yeah. he's you know? that's how, that's how I look. That's how I always looked at bodybuilding when I was a kid. You're sculpting a body, um, like a sculpture, like Arne would say, you chisel it out. You know, a right. sculpture. So what 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 helped me with bodybuilding that a lot of people don't know um, is that I was able to look at my physique in the mirror as an artist. So I was blessed. I was born and blessed with that with a the shape, you know, with a nice shape. But I was able to sculpt it way way more, and I visually I had the eye. I knew what looked good. I, I was a I was a perfectionist with that. So I knew that, hey man, I already got wide shoulders and a small waist, but if I make my shoulders wider and I make my back wider, my waist is gonna look even smaller. If my, my, my legs look bigger, my waist is gonna look even smaller. So I wasn't just throwing crap around when I went to the gym. I knew right. exactly what I was doing because I was an artist before I got into bodybuilding. So when I looked in the mirror, I looked at every single detail what needed to be done to create the illusion of looking better. Now, had I not had that fundamental, fun, fundamental physique that I was born with, I don't think I would have been able to do that. So I was blessed George, that I had. George, let me say this. I, I judged, I competed for many years, judged all that, MC the shows and, and promoted. Uh, and I know this, I, I can't say that you had the perfect physique, but because nobody does, but you probably came as close as humanly possible. <laughs> no, really, but you know, you're looking through a lineup and I think the best, the most complete bodybuilder is the one who has nothing that really, no body part that stands out much more than any other. Would you say you, you had a, a very good blend like that? Yeah, yeah. You, you're going to have something. Um, okay. So let me tell you what I thought the idea of physique was. Um, my idol, when I learned about Lee Haney, I, I put Lee Haney as my idol. Um, and, and, I, and again, I had other people that I looked up to, but to me, Lee Haney was, can I say this, God. Like, yeah. I think I would have like melted if I had seen him during those years. No, oh, yeah. Lee Haney had the, the wide shoulders. He had the big chest. Lee Haney's chest reminded me of Arnold. I knew that I could get a big chest. I was born with 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 a blessed with a, with genetics to grow a big chest, and I had a small waist and I had a big a, a wide back. To me, a physique needed to be symmetrical and it needed to look um, a little bit rugged, like tough, you know, and strong. To me, chest, chest and arms and a back meant strength, you know. So that's how. It, I don't know if you could build a physique visually that way, but that's what it meant to me. To me, Arnold looked like a like a sculptor physique, but he looked strong too. Lee Haney, the same way. 
And I knew that I was blessed in this area up here. And I needed tight chest pulls. It, it literally, I could stand toe to toe with anyone. I had a huge chest. George, and, um, from what you're saying, I wouldn't even grant that you, that you're, I, I, I think one of your most potent weapons you had at this point when you started training was not the chest and the width and this narrow waist. You had something that most people don't have, and that's called self-awareness, meaning you were able to look at yourself objectively and understand what you had and you knew how to work on it, which you, would you Absolutely. say? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 because I had, um, when, when, I, when I did my first diet for, for a show, and um, I, I think I only died two or three weeks for that, um, and then again, that was the first show that I did. I, I, this guy, I had this guy um, um, guide me and teach me. He put me in a diet. But then after that show, I wanted to do better. And then I started asking around the gym. I started asking the best bodybuilders, like, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to get better Like with this diet? And then I started changing my diet. And, and every two weeks, I was changing my diet into this, this, this guy named Eddie Nieves, who had won the Mr. Florida. He was older. And he was a judge at the time, too, told me, he goes, George, you need to learn this stuff on your own because what you're doing is you're asking everyone around the gym how to do this stuff and you're never going to learn for yourself and if you don't learn how to what these foods do how many calories how many grams of carbs how many grams of fat if you don't learn how to do this stuff yourself then you're always going to end up blaming everyone learn to do this stuff on your own and if you ever fail you only have you but yourself to blame and it hit me like a ton of brick you know because i was willing to learn you know, I was, that was a point in my life where you would tell me if I needed to eat, you know, crap, that's what I was going to do. So when he told me this, it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, okay, I'm never going to ask anyone. <laughs> I, I need to learn what these calories do and carbs and protein. And the only thing that I might need is somebody suggesting me how I look, you know, to give you, to build that confidence. George, um, the, the interesting thing at that age, a lot of young guys, I hear this, I have to learn on my own, they'll say. Nothing, there is never a dumber statement, especially if you have somebody ahead of you that's done it and they can teach you so you save time. So you were, you know, you had the clarity of mind to understand, to find people yeah. who are already successful. Uh, absolutely. So I would grab, you know, I would, I would have a sheet of paper or a notebook and I would um, total – my calories for the week, how many, how many calories I'm going to eat for the next two weeks, what my body fat is. Okay, I started this diet at 8% body fat, 12 weeks away. At, at, at eight weeks away, I want to be a 6% body fat. And George, you could, you George, were, George, two questions. Because I'll, I'll cut you off here because I want to backtrack. Two questions. When you grew up in your household, was it healthy eating for you for the most part via what your family provided and also um, – your training later on, just from what you're telling me, would you say it was more scientific and more calculated? So those two things, you know, growing up and then later on. No, well, growing up, we ate everything. It wasn't it until it, we, yeah, we were middle, you know, middle class, a little bit lower than middle class. Um, a lot of people think think that I came from money and wealth, and it's not like that. <laughs> Um, I had an average, you know, my, my parents were average. I wouldn't yeah, say middle I, class. No, 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 I hear you. Me too. I mean, uh, but what I mean is, you know, here's a funny story for you. Mike Katz is a good friend of mine and his son is also a friend. And when they were filming Pumping Iron here in Connecticut, yeah, um, some of the bodybuilders would stay at Mike Katz's house. Arnold stayed there, Franco, but Robbie Robinson was staying there. And Mike Jr. was sitting there eating Fruity Pebbles. This was probably like 1973 or something. And Robbie Robinson just walked by and he looked at he looked at Mike. The little, he's a little kid. Mike's like seven years old. And then Robbie just said, "You're not going to get big eating that stuff." You know, <laughs> he, he, he didn't know Mike Junior. Right. But, but my point is, you know, growing up, were you were you more eating like you know eggs and the balanced diet, or were you now? When you say food? growing up, you mean before bodybuilding or yeah, before, uh, yeah, grow, yeah, in other words, how you're brought up and did that lead? No, you no, we ate whatever, everything fried. You know, okay, everything, right. everything was fried. Now. When I, when I first got into bodybuilding, the, those first two years, I was so skinny, and I, I didn't know anything about nutrition. Yeah, what you, I, weigh, you told me what you weighed when you started. 108. I had gotten sick. I went down from like 114 to 108, and the doctor advised that I start training. Really? Okay. Yeah. So he tells me to eat a lot of food with high in calories. To me, high in calories meant, you know, like a bacon double cheeseburger when I first came out in Burger King. 
uh, TV dinners. That's what I thought he meant by calories. So we, we I never knew that I was going to be a bodybuilder. So I'm just trying to gain weight, right? right? I'm trying to gain weight. And it wasn't into, into I signed up in, in a real gym um, called, um, when Ghost Gym first arrived here in Miami, I signed up in Ghost Gym. I was like uh, the, one of the first members there. Wow. And I saw my first bodybuilder there and he was eating tuna and rice. Oh. And, that, and that man told me, because you want to get big, this gets you big. Eating tuna and rice or potatoes. So I, I started swallowing that food at that time. But the big change came when I first competed in the Team USA when I was 16. There, I met some, you know, older kids that were bodybuilding, obviously, and they were more advanced than I was. I beat them, but they were bigger, you know? And I'm, I'm asking them, like, what's, you know, how, how do you get like that? And then you got to eat healthy all year round, not just now. Right, right. And, you, and, you, and you know, when we talked off, off, off video, you were talking about the bulking from back in the day. You were involved with that. I know I was, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, yeah. how, how, high, how high would you go above your competitive weight? Well, I, remember, every year I was trying to progress. So I, I, it wasn't like I had a steady weight. Remember, I started as a lightweight. So my goal was to get as big and as heavy as I could. But I could normally not gain any more than, you know, 25 pounds right um i used to eat 54 counting this is counting calories 5400 calories a day wow yeah counting you, every single meal were you eating all day like what was that 10 meals the whole day eating man <laughs> <laughs> you know it takes 45 minutes to swallow a meal what you your know, parents, that, how'd your parents feel about you training were they okay with it at first or you thought my, it was too much? no my, my my parents um they they you know, it was a, it was a sensitive time in my life because it was either do that or go the go down the the wrong road, you know. And I didn't want to. My all my friends were smoking, doing right. coke, and partying. And when I found bodybuilding, uh, I could have easily gone that way. And bodybuilding um kept me away from there. And then when I found out that I was good, and I and I won my first show, I'm like, man, I'm gonna go this route instead of going the other route. Um. The, the, the only thing that my mom didn't like it was that, you know, she found out that I was taking steroids at a young age. Right. And um, how, obviously, how, how, young, how young did you start? I started at 14. At 14. Okay. You remember yeah. what you did? DECA. Like one one shot of DECA a week. Well, now, who, now, who advised you? Who hooked you up with that? You don't have to give their name or anything. but Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very open. I'm, no, that's you know, good. Myself, it's very know? helpful. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't, um, I don't push drugs on anyone or steroids? No, of course not. Yeah. No. Um, well, my, 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 George, my take on that is, I hate to say these three words, I don't care. Because it, it's I, I, it's like a disregard. I don't, it's not that I disregard, but to me, it doesn't, it's incidental, it doesn't really matter. It's not really what we're talking about, but it's right. obviously something that's present. So you start. Oh, yeah. you, I'm, I'm very open because I, I always remember I had a, a, a good friend of mine that was older. You know, he was 20 something and I was, at that time, I was 16. He goes, George, when people ask you to take steroids, tell them yes, because you're really? gonna look like a, yeah, because you're gonna look like a fool, lying. So when you were yeah. 14, did you? How did you respond to Deca once a week? Did well, you remember, you, you gotta remember that back then steroids were legal, you know. Yeah. So right. so we could go, we could go across the the gym and go to the pharmacy, and we we would buy a bottle of Deca for six dollars, wow. and they would they would give you a bottle of Deca and a syringe, and it was totally legal. Now. When my mom found out, she didn't like how, it. How, how did she find out? My brother, my brother, my brother told my mom. <laughs> and um, how did I get into it? My best friend was 16. I was 14. We're walking back from the from the youth fair. And um, he just told me what he was doing. He was doing and that. George, we, got, we, we got one of your neighbors uh, down in West Palm, my good friend Lance Stranahan. Great body. Hi, He's my, my age from back in the day, but he says this about you. I admire the honesty here. I see pics of teenagers that look like world-class bodybuilders and they always say, no, I was natural there, even though it's doubtful. So your yeah. honesty is refreshing and it's welcomed and it's, we thank you for it. So well, we were, thank you, thank you. We were we were all taking it when we were competing. You know, the, 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 maybe the guy who got 27th place on the team nationals, the team USA, we didn't take it, and that's why he got twenty-seven. Right. You know, but 
But all the all the you kids know, that's, are about, that's about that's about as honest as I've ever heard anybody come through on any level in bodybuilding. Well, let me let me ask you a question. Let me let me ask you a question. Go ahead, go ahead. If I tell you I didn't take them, what are you gonna think? You know, I'm gonna tell you, I wouldn't think oh, we lost you. It because I just don't let it mill about in my head. But to, to see, but just like to reiterate what you're saying, to to compete at that level and win and be among the best, I would just say it's unlikely. You know. I'd say there's a there's a potential because all right, listen, you got something called um um you know you might be uh um uh, somebody who lacks a certain uh Hold gene, on, Mike. Um, oh sorry lost you anyway thanks everybody for being here uh I lost George for a second I know he's got two kids in the house so maybe he has to tend to them for a second he's back okay you okay George I lose you. George, seems he has to, uh, I think we lost audio here for a few seconds. Let me check. Uh, he may have to reboot here. Uh, it's interesting, um, back in the 80s, he is right. I know plenty of people who went uh, to the pharmacy. They would just go to the pharmacy and you could just go in there and buy a bottle of Anavar or Decadaravalin or testosterone and get the syringes. And, and it was legal up until I think 90 or 91. So we're different times. And, uh, you know, 14, I didn't know that. I'm, I'm glad he told us that. Uh, hopefully he's getting back on here. George, you want to reboot? And uh, if you could hear me, uh, like, oh, here we go. Yeah. George. I'm sorry. Was that me or you? That's okay, man. Oh, uh, no. you're back. Yeah. Was you're that good. me or you? So, so continue about the other uh, DECA and you, you're getting at the pharmacy of 14 and you're moving along. Oh, oh. oh, there you go. Yeah, this is lagging. No, you're okay. Well, so my, my question to you is, I, I, it, it's, I don't, I'd rather be honest than lie. So if I was to tell you I did it naturally, what would you think of me? You know, I'm lying. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't say much. I, I understand why some people don't want to talk about it. It might affect their job. Right? Or, yeah. Mike. Yes. No, I got you. Yeah. Sure. Hey, yeah, This I'm, I'm kind of lagging here. Yeah. Uh, do your best. Can man. you hear me you fine or not? You can still hear you. Hold on. Let me move out of here. Okay. No, it's okay, man. I can, I can talk. Okay, let me go. Keep the ball rolling. If you have to reboot, that's fine. Okay, so going back to what I was asking you, if, if if I was to tell you I was natural or did it naturally, what would you think of me? Think um, of mine, right? Yeah, well, again, see, me, I wouldn't ask you that. <laughs> but other people, yeah, you know, like I've got I've got Chef Rush coming on here. He's the uh the, he's the cook for he's going to be on tomorrow. He's the cook for the White House and he's got 23 inch arms and 700 pound bench and somebody comes on right away and they say oh let's see his legs probably doesn't have any legs you know there are people who they always <laughs> wanted this you know they look at george Bencourt and say oh well that's all drugs this and that and just that type of thinking to me you know when somebody yeah. when somebody looks at you and they say automatically drugs whether they know it's true or not that's really an indictment on themselves in other words they don't think they could do what you did without drugs so uh right. i just don't go there but i see what you're saying and i appreciate that. right and and we we all know it's not all you know we all know what it takes to get there you know hey, if you're not willing hey george at age 14 what kind of gains did you get from that one shot of deca a week <laughs> not much you know sure. i think i gained i think i gained like eight pounds in in a total of six weeks or something like that or, yeah, or that's not a lot or yeah or, or eight weeks and, and then they introduced me to testosterone. So oh. then I took so then I took off the 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 DECA and I started taking one shot of test a week for the following four weeks. So I did like a total of 10 or 12 weeks in total. There I gained a lot more. So I think in total in that cycle of 12 weeks, I think I gained like 18 pounds or 20. Wow. But really? I remember it's all blow. It's all blow because I'm eating yeah. bacon double cheeseburgers, TV dinners. <laughs> That's not <laughs> so, good now. <laughs> So, so when was your first show? Your first, I, I've got you on here. The, the first one listed on Muscle, uh, 
what is his muscle memory is the 88 Southern States, which you won your the teen lightweight, but you competed before that, right? No, the first show I did was it was that one. Uh, oh, no the teen, yeah, it was the it was the Southern States teenage division. Um here, hold on, let me get my notes here. Hold on, give me a few That's notes. okay. I like George. He just gets up and <laughs> he walks out, comes back. <laughs> I told him this is conversational and laid back, so he takes me Yeah, away. so uh, what, what do you have there, 88 or 87? We don't need any of that regimentation like we're working for IBM. You and I are free agents, man. We do what we want, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, man. So, so, so my first show was in 88, um, the Team no. Southern States, uh -huh. and I won that as a lightweight. And um and I won the most promising award when I won that show. Well, what did that mean? How how they the most promising? I think um I guess the brightest future, you know, like he'll have George, a you, George, you know John Defendus, right? Of course. Yeah, we've never met um face to face, but he's someone that I used to look up to too. You yeah, know, I had many John, many people John, that I looked John was originally from that area back then and nationally, even up here in Connecticut, we knew. And you kind of fill this. this uh, he wasn't. We knew that if you were to compete in Florida, you better be shredded because the guys down there were absolutely. Yeah, we, Florida was one of the better states, you know. It was California, Florida, and, and New York, I think, you know. Uh, yes. These three, these three states were say, the. When you say most promising, so they saw you and they said, man, this play, the, the people approach you and say, hey, man, you got to go in the nationals. No, well, not in the nationals, but they, they they thought I had a promising future. That's why it's called the most promising. So, but I didn't even care. Like I didn't even know what it was. You know, it wasn't until like another or two shows later when I realized, oh, I'm I'm I'm, I'm good. You know, I, I'm I'm good at what I'm doing. So winning winning the trophy, it meant a lot. It meant more to other people than to me. You know, it, I just I didn't know what I have won. So. It, it wasn't until a, I won my second show that I realized, okay, I'm pretty good at this stuff. George, we got a couple of comments here. Uh, Dan Solomon, uh, the head honcho of the Mr. Oh, Lincoln. no, no. Throw him off. Solomon, <laughs> Solomon just told us to behave. These were, you and I are having a lot of fun, man. We're, we're, we're just going to start flinging it, man. We're going to do whatever we want. Oh, we no. Got Joey Fulco, who was uh, – he, he was one of your predecessors. He won the Teenage USA, I think it was 78, so 10 years before you. Oh, I would. <laughs> uh, no, it might have been before that. I, I don't know what. And then uh, Peter Price, only a complete idiot is going to be fooled by a guy who one minute looks okay with a fair body, and a year later he is 15 pounds heavier, but his quality bulging mus vascular muscle. Peter, what about fresh water and bailing hay on the farm? If you are a person who knows their way around the gym, you can spot a user. By the way, George has always had classic physique, pure quality. Those great physiques don't exist anymore. So you thought Peter was going to bang on you, but he redeemed himself at the end and said, George is okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, Joey, 79. Sorry there, buddy. So, okay, so, Thank you. So, so again, you, were, you started really – I mean, was there a point where you started ramping up and really, really improving? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, uh, Michael, uh, from the minute – from the minute that I touched the weight and I actually signed up at a gym, I, I, I began hard. And it, and it was due that I had a good foundation when I started. It just happened to be that prior to Gold's Gym, there was a gym here in Miami. It was more of a racquetball um, club, but downstairs they had a gym. When I went downstairs to that gym when I was 14 years old, it just happened to be that by coincidence, I happened to meet some power lifters. Oh. They were older and they saw that I wanted to learn. So they took me underneath, you know, under their belt and they started teaching me and guiding me what to do. So the foundation, I got it right away. I learned how to squat. I learned how to do behind the neck presses um, and I learned how to bench those. I learned very, very, very well at 14, at 14 because I had power lifters around me. And they so were good just, power lifters. Just, just like we were, we were talking earlier before we came on about your supplement company, you had the right people around you. The same thing with training early on. You were able to eliminate a lot of the learning curve and save time because you had good guys to yeah. show you right there from the get-go. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's something that I've never even thought of until you told me. I mean, I basically learned right from the beginning.
You know, some people have to use this method, this calculus. If you see people doing things wrong and they're not getting good results, not just in the gym, anywhere in life, you know, I always say just do the opposite of what they're doing. <laughs> 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 so, so I got you know, here, you, 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 1989, you win the Teen USA Championships. And listen, I know this for a fact. I started, I competed as a teen from 79 to 83. Did poorly for the most part, but you know, you 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 go on these teen shows. There are like 50, 60, 100 kids sometimes. You know, the, the yeah, man. Of that you won the yeah. team USA championships. Dennis Newman was the heavyweight winner. You know, if he didn't get sick with leukemia, he he was like, you know, he was like another. He was like Superman. Uh, then he got Bo Matlock. I remember him. He won the light heavyweight. Gary Gomez. Bo Matlock. Bo Matlock went on to win the the USA. What's that? Bo Malak went on to win the USA. Yeah, no, right. All those, a lot of names right here that yeah. really went far. And, uh, but, but as a lightweight, you beat all these guys in the Team USA. Yeah. Well, you know, it, another thing too, like back then, there were so many kids competing. Um, and if you won the Team USA or the Team Nationals, you were destined to be a pro and a good pro, you know? Um, so we have people like Eddie Robinson winning. Right. They had Shane, Shane DeMora. Um, Sean Ray, oh, yeah. um, or what's um, Franco Centorelio, all right. those guys were my, my idols. And back then in the magazines, they used to put columns and pictures of them. So when I came around in 88, I used to see these teenagers in the magazines, Mr. America or, or you know, Mr. Florida or Mr. USA. And it was, to me, it was like, man, I, I don't know how to describe it, Michael, but it was like, it was like being Mr. Story, Universe. I can describe it for you. See, you became one of them. I used to see the guys who were my yeah. age, John Hansen, Rich Gaspari, uh, Troy Rich, Zubato, Rich Gaspari, Lee Haney, Mike, all these people. And, and they would all crush me. I stood next to uh, Chickarillo in the Teenage America. I was 17. I came in ninth. He came in third. He was 15. He was already like a man. So you could tell. To me, guys. yeah, to me, like when I would see pictures of Lee Haney, or, or Rich Gasparri winning the, 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 the Teen America, to me that meant you were like like Mr. Universe, you oh, know? God, listen, that was my goal. Yeah. That was, you, you know, know? It, it, it was, at the time, I remember how I used to think, and I understood how important time was, because you, teenage years are only, you know, from 15 to 19. That's why I took it, that's, that's why. And, and the clock is ticking, and, and there's only one chance. And to me, mm. it was just so important. And you know, listen, yeah, I, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't win, but I it, it, I got a lot out of it. I want yeah, to you want to milk it. What's that? You want to milk it. Yeah, you absolutely. want to milk it. You want to get as much out of it before you turn 20. And it just happened to be that I lived with my parents at that time. Right. So I knew I knew that I had a limit, you know, and I put everything, I put every single second of the day into that. It was my dream. You know, I wanted to be one of those guys. I never, to be honest with you, I never thought that I will become one of them, like a Mr. Teenage America. Well, you let me tell you, you did, and you're you're firmly yeah. entrenched in the sands of bodybuilding lore and time. I'll get the Peter Price's comment in a second. I want to say this. So 89 Teen USA, I'm assuming you were 18 years old at that point, Teen USA. Teen USA, 17. All right, 17. 17. So 14, a shot of DECA a week. What was the panoply of pharmaceuticals looking like at that point? Did it change a lot? Was it a lot more, or was it just more effective? Well, remember, at 14, I'm a kid. I'm not. I'm not getting right. all the information. No, right, it's not. Right. In, it's not until you turn 16 that you start finding out. Okay, there's DECA, there's TAS. But you know, back then, back then, a cycle, an off-season cycle was uh, a bottle of DECA a week and 200, maybe 300 milligrams of tests a week. Right. And maybe maybe some Anavar. And that was you know, it. You know, you know what that's like today? That's like taking a couple of well, tests. Yeah, or, that's your breakfast. Like, that's your morning breakfast today. That's like eating, that's like eating Pez candy, you know, from the little. Yeah. <laughs> so, so for anybody that tells you that it's just steroids, they're, they're you know, no, they, uh, they, they, listen, they. Listen, George, you included, I'm very honored and, and uh, privileged to be able to talk to the best in history here. And to a man, they all say that it's the drugs are down on the list. You've got to, you've got to, yeah, you got to have this, man. Oh, if you don't have this, 
it starts here. It's the food, yeah. it's the screening, it's the knowledge. It's it, it, yeah. Um, let me read what Peter Price said here. Uh, George, I'm a fan and always have been. I had a blown up poster of you at my home gym. How's it feel for people have posters of you in their wall? You don't even know who the hell they are. I you, are you no, look, it's it's cool. It's no, it's cool. I, really, I, <laughs> I, I used to look at it. To, you know, at that point, you were probably the best teenage physique yeah. in the world, at least for that yeah. day. And think yeah. about you know, billions of people for you to no. sing yourself out. Yeah, you, almost you, you, Yeah, you know, Michael. To be no, honest no, with you, let me, I, let me I, finish Peter's statement here. I took up bodybuilding after coming out of a coma due to a motorcycle crash. Wow, it's partly thanks to George's picture. Listen, I grew like crazy and got my life back. So thank you, George. All these years later, you're just finding this out. What do you think of that? Wow, man. Well, tell him I'm, I'm glad I was able to help and, and motivate. You know, I myself too, I had pictures of, you know, Gasparri in, in, in my watch, Sean Ray. Um, and there's many people, Francis of Enfado. I saw it. I had other people, just like him, I had other people, you know, to motivate me. Right? What, what, what amazes me when you were asking me, how does it feel? You know, I think with this, with this internet and, and um, Facebook, and I, I cannot believe that I still have fans <laughs> after so many years. And there, and and you can see that they come from anywhere from the world, from around the world. I mean, it's 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 crazy, you know. And again, like I told you, I never thought that I'll become one of those guys, but it it, it, it happened, you know. You know, it happened. It, and the thing is, you achieved something big, and that when you're old and hopefully make it that far, and you're thinking back on your life, you have one less regret because you. Absolutely. So you had the potential and a lot of people have it and they just they're afraid or they don't do the right things. Hey, um, Peter, let us know uh, when you had the coma. Did you come out of it? And did you have like a hemiplegia or difficulty moving your arms? I mean, and you, you, you just kind of used the poster as an inspiration and you started training slowly. Just give us a little details on that, uh, George. So, OK, so you, you won that. So what decided you're still a young guy? You won, won a Teen USA at 17. This is about longevity. Too. We'll get to that. But this is interesting stuff, uh, especially with the pharmaceutical use. And, you know, I think it's very important and illuminating that you talk about that. 1990, you win the teen nationals. And again, you know, the guys that were winning it back then, a little, just a few years before you, Jeff King, uh, Victor Terra. <laughs> I mean, guys that like were Olympian. You know, listen, you're, you, you stand next they to They were the best in the world. They were the I best. Stood, I stood next to King. I looked like a tattoo on his pec, man. I mean, it was like I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I that's what I was trying to to achieve but it was it was almost impossible you know like, how I got there I have no clue but <laughs> well, well, the, the team nationals you're like the guy to beat now right so what was it like going in there I'll just read these guys heavyweight I don't know this guy Paul Grappis but Chris Bennett I knew him he was from Connecticut light heavyweight he ended up winning the NABA USA or something middleweight you won that so you moved up the middleweight and then Van Nguyen was the lightweight winner. So you, you had full classes here. It was very competitive. So what, yeah. what happened then? You won that. The team national. Okay, so so when I when I so on the team you say I won my weight class. I didn't win the overall. The overall was um who was it? Dennis Newman? Uh no, actually hold on a second. Team the team no, USA? They, have, they have you as the overall winner here, team, team USA. No, 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 no. It was Dennis Newman who won the team USA. Let me just read to you what I have here uh, from Muscle Memory. Good sight. The guy's pretty accurate. Apparently not here. They have Newman winning the heavyweight, Bo Matlock, light heavyweight, Gary no. Gilmer, middleweight. No, 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 no. Light, lightweight. And they, they said you won the overall, but I guess it was Newman. No, it was Newman who won the overall, right? Okay. All so, right. So um, so Dennis, Dennis Newman won the overall. He was 19. I was 17. Um, it was his last year. Bo Malak won the light heavyweight class who, who looked amazing. And um, I knew that the following year, well, well, what what I put in my head was, okay, that's the title I need to win, the team nationals. I have another two years. So I need to take advantage of the next two years before I'm 20. So the following year, I completely, I trained, let's just say um, balls to the walls, if that's the right term. Sure. And I finally, I finally got to train for a full year for one show. That was it. Um, yeah, because I, I knew from reading the magazines that the pros, they if to, the, the good pros, they would train to compete once a year. You know, right. if if they really wanted to win a show, that's what they would do, so they could make the gains. So I disconnected and I just trained for a full year, 
every day, six days a week. Back then, it must have. I, I think I trained um, uh, um, every body part twice a day, as per week. Wow. Um, so it was it, within three days you train your whole body. Yeah, back then we're talking about what 1988. Um, there were times during the year that I would I would train twice twice um per day, and um. So I trained, and I knew that Dennis wasn't going to be there. I knew Bo Malak wasn't going to be there. So I knew it was going to be me and a fresh crop of teenagers coming. And um, from the minute that I weighed in, my friend Mo that came with me, as soon as I took off my clothes to weigh in, he's peeking through the window, like through a door like that, like the who, one that happened behind me. Who, who, who is this? Who's peeking? My, my training partner, Mo. I had a oh, training partner. Okay. One of my, my best friend, friends. My, my good friend here, Dr. Walter Bennett, just chimed in. And I have to ask you a question about this. I remember your pick on the cover of NPC Mag with Alfie Newman when you won. And did you also win a date with Alfie, Alfie Newman? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Alfie Newman won the Team USA. I think she got second in her class um, oh, cool. the, year that I, the year that I did the Team USA. She wasn't in the Team Nationals that year, the year no. that I competed and won. George, I so, will say this, though, and this is for Walter, too. When, when This was the time I remember that cover, and when George appeared on that, that's when every, the buzz started where he was the next Frank Zane, Bob Paris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were, the, you were the rage. But unfortunately, at this time, what was happening was they were shifting over to gigantic leviathans that they wanted yeah. to be the winners, not so much, you know, the yeah. you know, artistic. That was, that was about two years after. So, so, so that year going into the team nationals, I knew I had an open road and, and, and it was me against whoever the new kids were coming. And it just happened to be that, I, that I won my class and I won the overall, and it was a pretty clear, um, win, you know, like I'm not, I'm not going to tell you I had all perfect scores for the overall, but, um, I won, you know, <laughs> <laughs> winning is always a, a bonus. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's a high, you know, but yeah. I, 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 I tell you, I knew that I was going to win the minute, the minute I, I, I took off my clothes and I weighed in because my friend was peeking through the door at the weigh-ins and he was right. Like imagine he was looking through that door. And when I turn around, I look at him, he tells me you're going to win. Right. So I just get off the weight scale. I want to turn around. I have all the teenagers looking at me when I got off the weight scale and I knew that that meant something. I wasn't sure exactly what I meant, but I could tell all their eyes were like, <laughs> like wide open. Right. Yeah. So, so I put his comment, my friend, you know, what he told me, then all the, all the teenagers were looking at me and I'm going, man, I think I'm going to win this crap. So when I walked out the door, I tell Mo, I shook his head. I go, yo, I think we're going to win this year. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you did the same thing that Sergio did to Arnold the first time he competed against him. And Arnold, you know, just thought he was going to win. And all of a sudden he saw when Sergio took his robe off, he was like deflated. He goes, there's no way I could beat him. You know, yeah, like that, I, yeah you, you get that. that well, I did see it. Well, I did see one kid that 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 I thought was going to challenge me. And he did for the overall. He, I have no clue who he, I don't remember who, who, who he was. But I know that he weighed like 220 and he was a teenager. Um, yeah, you know, probably the heavyweight, really, Paul, Paul Graffis. Yeah, it was, it, was a he, it was a heavyweight. And um, and um, he was scary. <laughs> <laughs> he was scary. He didn't have a pretty physique. He didn't have a pretty physique. He was just one big dude. Um, you, so 91, you're only 21 years old. No, you're 20. And you won the Southern State. I remember State. we still got the, after the team nationals. Then I won the Southern States Open class, the men's open class, when I was wow. 19. Yeah. Is that not there? Yeah, no, it's there. There it is. Yeah. Right. So, so after the you beat so a lot after of the team, guys. Yeah, after the team nationals, um, I couldn't compete anymore as a on the team divisions because um it was a it was a taboo back then for me to take the title away from someone that was coming up in, in, uh, in, okay. in the you know right. in the bodybuilding world so there's it was not, a taboo there's not, there's, not, there's not too many taboos anymore people can pretty much do whatever the hell they want unfortunately yeah. <laughs> like you might well, not have any rules anymore no back back then they didn't want me it, it's not that they didn't want me to compete but everybody that I, that was involved in the industry that, that told me you you it's it's a taboo to take the title away from someone you gotta let other kids compete okay so as a yeah so as a so as a, when i was 19 i couldn't compete anymore as a teenager so I entered the Southern States, the men's Southern States. 
um, as a middleweight. And um, I ended up winning my class in the overall. And I beat uh, Mike Francois, who went, on, who went on to win the Arnold Classic after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you went in your first nationals in 91 was won by Kevin Lavroni. So, yes, like yes. Was, I went in there as a teenager. No, I went I in there as a teenager right yeah, after the Southern States. Right uh -huh. after the Southern States, um, I told Peter Potter I wanted to continue competing. He's like, no, you need to stop and take a break. But, you know, you get on that high. Of, yeah. um, you, you're unbeatable. You're unstoppable. George, so let me I, ask you. At, at, at this point in your life training and you're still a real young guy and your parents were proud of you like you said you've had a lot of success rapidly it doesn't mean you didn't train hard because you were very fastidious in everything you did uh from what you say uh what was your purview of what was to come in the future did you think did you have any designs on actually going to california you know aligning yourself with weeder becoming a pro maybe someday winning mr olympia or did you think this is just something you know because you ended up with a supplement company but you know, how did you get from one point to another and how, you know, because ultimately the last time you competed was 2006 in the Nationals. Right. Right. Well, I took 12 years off after competing. I opened up a business um, because I always told myself that by the age of 21, I was going to get out of the, if I wasn't making money in bodybuilding, I was going to get out and make a life for myself. Okay. So when, so, so when I was 19, I won the men's Southern stage, my, the middleweight class and the overall. Then I went into the men's um, nationals at 19. Um, I kept dieting right after the Southern stage, but I was burned out completely by the time I entered the men's nationals. And I ended up getting 13th place. That's the year that Kevin LeBron won. Um, yep. and, and I was a teenager. I didn't look good. I was, I was completely flat. And I just, I, I, want, I gave up mentally weeks before. By the time the nationals came, I think I was in a diet for 22 weeks. Yeah. And I, I, it just, it wasn't me anymore. Right. So anyhow, so when, when I was 20, I wanted to compete in the nationals again. And I wanted to be not the youngest pro because that title goes to um, Shane DeMora, but I wanted to be like the second youngest pro, you know? Um, I think Sean turned pro at what, 21? I know right? he, 21? He, won, he won the nationals, his class at 19. And, uh, you know, I think he won the first pro show he went in. He came in second, like night of the team. Yeah, but the man's the man's nationals. I think he won when he was 21 years old. So I, my, I wanted to beat I wanted to beat Sean Ray as the um, to win the nationals um, as a middleweight. But when I was training for the show, um, I tore a pec. Uh, I got a slight pair a slight tear in a pec. And um, so I went and I got operated and it came out fine. It came out perfect. George, what were you doing? Uh, what, what exercise were you doing when you tore your pec? What, what, you know, bench, you know, oh, which yeah. is what, <laughs> which is how everybody yeah. tears it, you know? Uh -huh. um, so, um, so that put me off to the following year. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, this, you know, this put me, this sign put, put me in, it sidetracked me, but I could get back. It wasn't a bad tear. My pec came out fine. And um, so I started training for the 1993 USA, I believe, and um, 1993, and that's when Hurricane 92 or 93, and that's when Hur Hurricane Andrew came. If you remember that, that Hur I Hurricane came to South Florida. Yes. And um, at that time, I was already like t almost turning 21, and um, that was my time to get out of the sport and to build a life for myself. So due to Hurricane Andrew, that was my limit of how far I was going to go. Because to that point, I still hadn't made any money in bodybuilding. And, you know, I used to look at the magazines as a kid. And I thought, again, I was very naive. I thought that being in a magazine meant you were rich and yeah. wealthy. Right. right? right. But as, as I got a little bit older, I started finding out that there's no money in this sport. and 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 I think it hit me hard when I won the team nationals because I remember standing on stage and then going home and I was expecting for Joe Weeder to call me or something, you know, and I no. never got a call from Joe Weeder. And, and I, I was like very strange because I didn't know how the industry worked. And you got to also, right. like I said in the beginning of the, of the podcast, I did all of this on my own. I didn't have a pro bodybuilder here guiding me. Had wow. I, if I had, if had, I, had I had a, a mature bodybuilder 
guiding me and, and te teaching me the ropes of bodybuilding, then I would have done a lot better. But I, I didn't have that. So I didn't know how to make money. I thought that by being famous and winning, you make money. And that was the furthest from the truth, you know? So by 21, I, I told myself, well, you know, I'm still young. I need to get out and go create a life for myself and go into business because I've always liked business. So I went and I opened up. Before you talk about business, two questions for you. Did you, did you become your best as far as what your physicality would allow? And do you ever look back and say, I should have kept going to see how far it could have went? I should have kept going. Yes, that's a yes and a no questions that sometimes, you know, if I had the proper guidance, yes, on my own, I I I would have destroyed myself. Um, you how know, so? I would, I, how so? How so, I, Michael? I I lived and died bodybuilding, man. You know, if if it was live or die, I would have died doing what I loved. You know, and that's how I became successful. Um, my, my, I, advice, I, my advice is uh, don't die. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but 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 I mean it when I tell you that. You know, okay, you know who has the same exact mentality? John Defenders had it. Yes, oh and, yeah. And, right. It was do or die. And I'll be honest with you, for me it was do or die, and I was gonna win, you know. And, George, and that, those, those years, those years of competing, did you have girlfriends that supported you yeah. or didn't? Or? Right, you all you they they were I had girlfriends. Um like I you know, I had a long-term relationship for a few years there, then I had another one. And but I was cuckoo, man. It was me and me against the world. You know, I was gonna win no matter what. You know, and my knowledge, my knowledge came from Arnold's books. And Arnold said, if you father die, you don't care. You keep going. You know. Well, so that's what I'm reading. Arnold, Arnold said in Pumping Iron, if his car gets stolen, I just he don't didn't care. He got it it matter, it. Right. Right. So that that was my knowledge. You know, that was my that that's what I learned. And I. It's it is fine, but you gotta you gotta be flexible with it. But I wasn't flexible. I wasn't flexible. Had I had somebody older guiding me, hey George, you need to chill out. You know this is this, you know this takes it takes time. I didn't have time. I didn't want time. I want to do it now. I'm gonna win now. George, and, were, um, were you were you healthy all the time? Yeah, doing bodybuilding. Yeah, yeah. So you always had good health, and you never threatened that, and you have it today. Ask, to ask you, all of a sudden, not that you didn't have balls because you did, but you had the balls to go into a bit. All business is hard. All business is difficult. But you went yeah. into an extraordinarily difficult business, which is a supplement industry, and you opened your own nutrition company. How, when when did that come along? And tell us well, how. That started, uh, that's, that started in 2003. But in, in, in when I got out of bodybuilding, right, at 21, about two years after I got out of bodybuilding, I went and I opened up a, a, a personal training gym. Okay. And I, I was very successful for the beginning. Um, I, I paid the gym off in three in three months. I paid off the gym, and we started wow. making money. Yeah, we started making money immediately. But in my heart, when I got out of bodybuilding at twenty one, I told myself I need to become a man and grow up. And if I if I ever want to get back into this, I could do it later because I'm still so young, you know. Right. Right. But. I was super young. I'm like, I could come back five, 10 years from now and be 30 years old and go compete. You know, I was a baby still. So, so at 23, I got out of bodybuilding at 21. At 22 or 23, I started my, my, actually it was my second business, which was a, a personal training gym. And, um, and, and we became successful. So I thought life was like, I thought life was always, you know, like anything I do is gold, you know, like you just oh, yeah. become successful because I had a track record. Everything I did was successful. And it was just, you know, I guess hard work and luck. It wasn't until I got into the business of supplements in 2003 where, well, then that became a real business, you know, where, okay, this is, this is. George, starting that out, did you, now, is that another thing you just did on your own also? You had to have some type of uh, consultant. No, no, I, I, I started on my own. I had the gym and from the back of the gym, I, I created my first um, product. Um, which was a fat burner um, liquid. That's when VPX was doing Clenburex. Um, so, so we kind of we kind of copy that. And and me, I started it on my own. I I saved all my money, man, since I was a kid. You know, I I, I was never a, a spender. 
So by the time I was 23, I already had a bank account. I had my house. I had a car. George, um, when, when you developed that product in the back of your gym, it's very interesting. Um, how did you just start sending it to selling it to members? Did you market it like through a magazine, or how did you how did you make your sale? I had no clue, no no clue what how to sell it. All I wanted to do since I was a little kid was become famous and be in the on the. I wanted to be in the magazines, and then the only way that I knew that you could make any money out of this bodybuilding industry, the only people that I saw making money were the people that were. Um, being um that, that was sponsored by my supplement companies so when i was 19 there was a supplement company down here in florida that still exists to this day that called me when i was 19 and they wanted to put me in their product because that's who, they, who, who can you tell me who that was i can't recall the name now but the okay. company's still around it's okay. been around for 25 years and um i told them no because they wanted to pay me like 500 dollars to use my image so i told them no and i was like um, in my mind, I told myself when I hung up the phone, I was like, you know what? If they call me, I could do this stuff myself one day. One day, I could do this stuff. I'm good enough. If they call me, I'm good enough to do this. Right. And I didn't like working for people. So, <laughs> so because I actually had my first business when I was like 18 years old. Sure, and then you I did ever, have you ever had a job interview? No. Me neither. <laughs> you know, and listen, I'm 56. It's too late. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get yeah. hired anywhere. So, you know, you, yeah, work, yeah. you work on your own enough that that's all you got, you know? Yeah. I So, so, um, so you developed the first product and did that yeah. take off eventually or did you have to make other products? Yeah. Yeah. And it started selling immediately because it had a Fedra, a Fedra in it. Yes. And a Fedra was hot at the time. But I didn't know anything about. I didn't know that you could sell products around the country. Like I didn't, even, I didn't know the concept. I thought I was just going to sell products in Miami and to right. a few people, right. and, and and that's it. But then there was this this man named Lester who worked for a company called um, ABB down here, and he was a distributor, and he was a power lift, not a power lifter, but he was a strong old man that I admired. You know, he was and like I, me. He was like me. <laughs> strong, strong old man that you could admire. Yeah. Oh, listen, listen. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not very strong. Well, this I, guy was. I mean, listen, getting old is good. He's a BT alternative, and you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know you're a man who probably admired. We have, we have mutual admiration, but enough of that. Enough of that. So he came and he he helped you out. Yeah, he he wanted to sell my products, and then I went from selling, you know, uh, from from a few little retails down here. He started distributing the product in Florida, and it's, and I was selling like 800 units a week. I mean, wow. a month, a month, a month, a month. Wait, wait, George, but, George. These people want to hear this. So you went from what to what with him? I, from, I was I was going directly to stores myself, and I was putting the product on the shelf myself. Wow. And I guess that started competing against him because now I'm cutting into his sales, right? Okay, right. So then they picked me up and they started putting my product all over South Florida, and they started selling like hotcakes because I had a Fedra. Now I didn't know what. I wasn't really paying attention to the sales because I had my gym to take care of. So I looked at the supplement as an extra income. You understand? So it wasn't something that I really, really wanted. Like at that point, it wasn't something like, oh, I'm going to sell my gym and do this. George, um, was your picture on the, the cover? The, on, on the, on the, on the advertisement. On the advertisement. Okay, good. I still have the ad, actually. <laughs> uh, cool. Yeah, it's very, it's, uh, the pro name of the product was called Rip, Rip Juice. Rip juice. Um, rip juice, and it came. It was in a liquid with a syringe, just like um, Climbutrex from VPX. Wow. And um, do you remember? Do you remember your initial outlay to produce that product, as far as money? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what did it cost? The the investment you mean, or or per, per, per yeah, unit, or per you're, unit? You're, you're making this in the best. See, I've got this picturesqueness in my head of you doing this, which is to me very cool. But you made this product in the back of your, you know, maybe not. Well, lower. I didn't make it there. I was so selling it from the back of You got the idea. What What did you have to put forth to get that done at first? Was it five grand, ten grand? I don't know, like fifteen thousand, twelve, okay. fifteen thousand dollars. All right, so it was a risk. Yeah. You, took, you took a chance. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And then, um. And then, um, but but again, I, I was good with my with my dollars. I, I I was always saving. I was I wasn't into spending, you know. 
Smart. Because nobody gave me anything. So yeah. I was afraid to lose what I had, man. So so when this product starts selling, I um I said, wow, I want to do this. But I didn't know what the numbers were. Like I didn't know 800 units a month was good. I, I didn't know that, you know. Um, and then so soon enough, um, right after that, I decided to sell my my gym um, and get out of that, that that business that I was in because I was starting to hate it. You know, it was like I had to wake up at five and be there at six and get home at nine thirty. Yep. And um, so then the the money from the from the gym, I put some money, not everything. I put some money and I developed two or three more SKUs, and um, and and then I gave it to a distributor and we started selling that way. But it was very I did, yeah, by the time I created the, the two, the next two or three products, then it, be, it got hard. Then How it became so? hard. because you you um because not not every product that you create sells. Right, right. You know, I just got lucky with that first one that I was selling like hotcakes. Right. You know, and then then you have manufacturing products. The product could go hard. You got to reformulate, throw the product away. You lost money. So I, I ran into a lot of that stuff. You know. Um, uh, but but you know there was potential, and my manufacturer saw that I was growing and that I was hungry because here you are, you have this bodybuilding kid that was a star that was just as hungry to sell products as hungry as he was for bodybuilding. So what I did, I put all that bodybuilding energy that I learned. Because now I'm 32 when I started Ben and Nutrition. I'm 32 now. I'm not a teenager okay. anymore. Right. Right. But my experience through life was if I give it all I have and if I do this hard, just like I did my training and like I did my gym, where my gym, I would wake up at 4.30, 5 o'clock every morning. I didn't want to wake up, but I was alone. I didn't have anybody to help me. And, and, and during those times that when I had the gym, I would look at myself in the mirror and tell myself, oh, man, you have to do this. You got to wake up. I didn't have a girlfriend during the time, so I was alone, you know? Right, right. And I would look at myself in the mirror and I go, you could do this. It's just like bodybuilding. You could do this. You could do this. And and so I put all that energy, I channeled that into the supplement um, company and the manufacturer saw the energy that I was putting into it. And then he wanted, the manufacturer wanted to have a bodybuilder, uh, a bodybuilding star, somebody that was semi-famous. Right. You know, and, and he helped me out. He put a lot of energy into my company. And then we got investors. And we grew Ben and Core Nutrition, you know, and they went from selling products in Florida to selling products all over the nation and then all over the world um, in a now, matter of that, um, that, that, that's I love hearing that. That's awesome. And, and, you know, because most people won't really tell you the truth, especially when they're successful. And that's very harmful to people trying to come up. But were you um were you going to uh, like expos and the Arnold Classic? Do you have setups for all that? And, you know, Bebo and all that. All yeah, well, the once the company, once the company grew, right? Once the company grew, um, and we started selling a few million dollars, um, because I had a capital investment firm, you know, backing us up. Yeah, I was able to fly to all the shows and do them. Yeah, we were part of it. You know, they're very expensive. You know, they, they were. Oh, right. you, you, yeah, you know, some of these companies spend two hundred. Fifty thousand dollars in a weekend, you know. It's, it's, a friend of mine it, here, my friend of mine used to own Sports One, one of the right companies back then, and yeah, they used to drop, you know, 150, 200 grand on the Arnold, you know, just to have a table. You know, a yeah, 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 yeah. But in yeah. those shows, in those shows, what happens is you make it up later, a few months later. You know, you get the contacts from all over the world, and then they start placing POs, and it's just, it's, you know, it's the initial investment that's very hard. You know, you know, straight, up, they, straight, straight up, you, you know, these shows now, everybody's there for their free goodie bag and they're there flexing and you can't even walk. I, I tend to think, do you really get the bang for the buck from just having a table for three days and you're dropping, you know, a quarter mil or whatever? Maybe not. Yeah, I know. You, you do. You do. Uh, you do. Not, you know, the sampling. It all, it all depends because every manufacturer gets their samples at a different cost. There's, 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 there's samples that could cost you. 25 cents or samples that could cost you 60 cents, you know? Right. Um, but what, what, what you do at a trade show is, you, you know, you have, you get your booth, you make it as loud as possible and you try to bring in customers from overseas, you know, and every PO you get from overseas minimum is going to be twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 minimum, right? You get a good account on those place, you know, initial PO $40,000, $50,000. And then remember that PO, it starts growing. 
builds, right? You know, it's, it's not, you, you know, throughout the years. And then hopefully you build a relationship, a long-term relationship with these customers. George, I've run businesses and I, I know how time-consuming business is and you've run, you know, a successful business for a long time. Were you able to train throughout? Did you stay in decent shape? I mean, your health was good. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. When I had my business, I, you know, I never stopped. I, I never stopped training. Um, I, I, I deflated some, you know, when I had um, from ninety, from when I retired from bodybuilding till I started banning for nutrition. I deflated some, but I trained six days a week. You know, and I still stayed in shape. And if I took off my shirt, I still look better than than everyone. You know, but but to, to not, me, probably not, probably not hard if you look at society these days. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, listen, I love my fellow humans, but you know, I got to call it as I see it. Uh, listen, people are in sorry, sagging shape, worse than ever now. So, so you did really well in business, and then you finally sold. What was it? Five years ago? Yeah, five and a half years ago. When 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 we. Um, when, when I got my investors into the company, part of the plan was to grow the company to a certain level, you know, and then flip it. Right. Um, and, but not only my a company. Lot, a lot of people don't realize the only reason to build a business is to ultimately sell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is very hard when once you let go, you know, you find yourself, yeah. And especially for me, it was very tough because I had to sell my name, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so there's somebody out there with my name now, you know. So yeah. it was very hard. Um, but, um, so the plan was to grow the business and sell it. And it wasn't only to sell my business. It was to sell a manufacturing plan because my man, my manufacturer, yeah, my manufacturer was, um, had invested in my company. So the goal was we're going to grow the manufacturing and we're going to grow Ben and Court together. And when we get here, we're going to put it up for sale. So we put it up for sale and immediately, um, vitamin shop. Vitamin Shop didn't come in to specifically buy Ben and Core Nutrition. They went in to buy a manufacturing plant, right? But because the manufacturing plant was tied up with me and I was tied up with them, then I was part of the deal too. You know, right. I was dragged along. I was dragged along. So it was a whole package together. Now at that time, I didn't want to sell my company, but because we were doing phenomenal, you know, um, I thought that we were. We still had like another two or three years left in the industry. And, um, you know, my partners, you know, they're like, George, if you sell now, you could be stuck with this thing forever, you know, because you don't get too many chances to, to escape these kind of industries, you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, these kind of businesses, sometimes yeah. you could go down with them, you know, oh, yeah. you could go down and, yeah, you and you're done. Little, you know, the market is, you know, look at the stock market. You know, I live and die with that. It lost, I don't know, 11,000 points a couple months ago. So, you know, yeah. if you're ready yeah, to yeah, yeah. fire and that happens, you're, you're done. You know, it's a risk. Hey, George, I have a question here, Walter, Dr. Bennett, but it may not apply to you, but maybe you might know a little bit about this. He says, with what's going on in China, have you had any difficulty getting raw materials for your supplement company? You may know about that anyhow. Would it be harder now with China because a lot of stuff comes well, from I don't, I don't, I don't keep up with it as much as before, right? Oh. But I have talked to a few manufacturers, and, and I know that up to two months ago, they were doing okay, you know? Um, Right now, I don't think there's, there's that much of a problem. They, there could probably be a few raw materials that are, that, that are hard to get, but they, from what I've, the people that I've talked to, they've been fine. They've been fine. George, since your son just started driving, he's 16, your other son's 11, obviously you got married while you had your supplement company. So your wife, she saw the 20 hour days and all that. Did she work with you in the company or she just let you go and that was it? She, she uh, my wife um, started the company with me, you know, oh, no, and we worked together. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we worked together the first few years, but then we wanted to kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> so she it. said, so you can't, you know, you can't. It's too much. You know, I'm a, I'm a, you got to do this. I'm doing it now. Ah, she's like, I'll do it later. I'm like, Peter, you got to do this now. <laughs> hey, George, so, if I point my finger like that in this house, I'll, I'll be less one finger. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So. So she went home easily. <laughs> she went home very easily, and she kind of, um, you know, she said, "Look, man, either I go home or we're gonna end up there." <laughs> so you're, she went home. You were successful selling the company, but something really bad happened after that. Let me just read this first from Peter Price. 
it was, uh, you know, he, he had, he was in a coma. You inspired him through your exploits. Uh, it was bad. They said to my mom, you should think about turning off life support. My mom prayed for two days and all my breathing and life support went crazy at the hospital. Anyway, I woke up against all the doctor's odds and diagnoses. There was a lot of wasting. I was in a coma for six months and my legs were so weak. I could not lift my arms. I was an adult and weighed less than a hundred pounds. The road back was tough. Then my brother brought in a bodybuilder magazine at a hospital. George was in it. And it was like a, well, it tails off right there, but you know, that's, that's what helped him. That's the thing he remembers that helped him. So I'm sure he thanks you there. No, man, tell him, tell him thanks, man. And, and, and um, it means a lot to me that I was able to motivate him. I mean, you know, when you hear stuff like that, it's, it's, it's touchy, man. You know, it's touchy. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're lifting others. So you got injured pretty badly. Yeah. I had a, you know, right, right, right before we sold the company, actually. Um, I had a slip and fall in front of my house and the step, um, there's two steps in front of my house. One of them hit me, one of my, um, on the vertebrae and I broke one of my ver um, um, vertebrae. And um, it, it, I literally broke my back. But the funny thing is, Michael, that I had my back broken for eight years and nobody knew <laughs> if you could believe that. Yeah, so I would go to the doctor and I would complain. You know, once every six months, I would go to the doctor and complain, hey, man, something doesn't feel right here. And um, the doctor would look at me, man, look at you, you're so strong. Um, you're a champ, you're a dog. You, there's nothing wrong with you. And he would send me home, you know? And after a few visits of- In these parts, that's called either negligence or malpractice, but anyway. <laughs> so, you know, I did that um, a few times. I went to the, to the doctor and he's just, George, you're an animal. You got nothing wrong with you. You just, wow. you know, this, this, yeah, just like that. But yeah. the thing is that I believed him because honestly, this guy had, um, he had um, done surgery me prior on my pec and it came out perfect. So because I had faith in him that my chest was, you know, my chest you, came out you, perfect. You, you trusted him, right? Yeah, yeah. So then I went seven years like that, you know, um, and I kept working out. But from, from, from year seven to year eight, something happened, something switched where I couldn't get up from bed, right? Wow. And I'm like, I'm like, man, there's something wrong with my back, you know? Like, I will wake up saying bad words every morning. Like, shit, fuck, I got to get my coffee. Oh, my back hurts. Oh, God. You know, so my wife, she couldn't take it anymore. Um, so then one day I'm working out in the gym, and this guy tells me, dude, you look like you're in pain. And I'm like, yeah, man, my, man, believe it or not, my back feels like it's broken, man. <laughs> I told the guy, I told that guy in the gym that. So I went, he goes, you got to check that out. So I went to a real back um, doctor and um, they did some stuff on my back. They injected me and they got the, the, the pictures back. And he goes, your back is broken. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, your back is broken. <laughs> wow. And, and this looks like an old injury because it was calcified, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And I, so he's asking me how that happened. No, I'm asking him, how did it happen? So I go, so how did it happen? He goes, I don't know. You tell me. And I'm like, I don't know. So then I go, so then I'm like, you know, like, like my life froze, you know, and I couldn't speak anymore. So I'm trying to figure out how my back broke, but I couldn't figure out then. So then, um, so I go, so what do you do now? And he's like, oh, well, you put two screws here and two screws here. And I'm like. Uh, so I, I couldn't speak anymore. Now I have tears in my eyes, you know, because I've been working out since I was 14 years old. I've never stopped. You know, I've never taken time off. You know, my discs, my disc between my vertebrae were perfect, even when I broke my back. Really? So now he's. Yeah. So now he's telling me he has to take out a disc mm. and I've taken care of my body all my life. So to take out a disc was the end of everything for me, you know, mentally. It's, it's demoralizing. I understand. Yeah. You know, so I'm like, so I'm like, man, I've taken care of myself my whole life. And now I gotta take out this thing out of my back and put four screws. I couldn't speak anymore. So I'm like, I'm in tears. So my wife took over the conversation and he goes, when you get it, he asked me when you want to get operated, you know, I'm like, shit, I don't know. You know? <laughs> so we set a date and we got we got operated. But um it um it changed my life, you know. It literally changed my life. It, it, you know, I'm healthy now. 
Um, and I've had all the injuries after that, but none of my injuries happened in the gym. So I, after I, I, before I had the surgery, I finally put two and two together that it was the day that I slipped and I fell in front of my house. That was the day that I broke my back. Cause it, it, you can't break a back lifting weights. It's just humanly impossible. What do you, you know, you could crush a disc, but not no. break a bone, not what break a bone. What do you think of the status of Ronnie Coleman now, the type of shape that he's in? Well, you know, I learned a lot from him. I hate to say it. Um, you know, when I saw that he got hurt after surgery, it, it told me, you know what, George, you need to cut it, you know, slow down because you could end up like him. So his demise was my learning kind of, you know, I'm like, I'm like, I just, I felt terrible, but looking at him, I'm like, you know, I can't go this, I can't go down the same route. So I had to line up on my training and, and, and so, so, so that I don't end up in the hospital again. Why do I think of him? I think it's a very unfortunate thing that happened to him. A lot of people think that, that, um, you know, it's the drugs and the training and that's why he's hurt. Unfortunately, I don't know if, you know, I don't know if a lot of people know, but literally the screws came off on his back and that caused another injury. How did the screws come off? Probably he started training too hard, too soon. I believe that when you're a bodybuilder and you've been operated like I have, he has, um, what might feel light to you is not really light. You know, we're animals, you know, we might lift 150 pound dumbbell presses and it might feel normal to us, but that's not really lightweight. No. You know? A hundred pounds, you think, oh, that's baby weight, you know, chest press or shoulder press. That's baby weight. I could do that 15, 20 times. Hey, but George, that's not normal. That's George, not normal. Hold on one second. You know, English is my only language, but I'll try reading this. Eddie Pineda, P I N E D A. George, me allegra or to historia? Me allegra or to historia? Oh, then he's happy about my story. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't something like I'm looking for you and I'm going to kill you. I like no, that. no. So, so, so for example, um, I believe Ronnie Coleman had hip surgeries from, from, you know, he had hip surgery. Older, he's fusion. Right. So he's, he, he, so if it's true that he was doing lunges again with a hundred pound, with 45 pound plates in his side, that might feel like 10 pounds to Ronnie Coleman. But it's not 10 pounds for the hips. It's still 135 pounds. Oh, that's right? true. Right. Right. So he might not feel it. I'm training light. I'm training light. I'm training light. But it's not light for the place where he got surgery. You know, it's not light where the screws is. It's right. not light where you can feel it. It's not. Once you have, uh, people don't always understand. If you need sir, if you absolutely need surgery, get it. If it's elective, think about it. If it's if it's kind of questionable, don't. Um, and that's not advice, by the way. But uh, once you have surgery, uh, that's more trauma that the body has to overcome. They're cutting you open. They're moving things around. You're getting scar tissue. So, yeah, ultimately, it's going to be healing, hopefully. But it also creates some collateral weakness and problems. So, yeah, you're right. His perception is he's doing this. But now he's got this new architecture that's not as. Right, right, you know, right. right. And I know how that is because, I've you know, I've been operated a few times. I've had a. a like I said, a few injuries. I've had two injuries in the gym only in 35 years, and I had 10 other injuries outside the gym. George, you know? that, would you say overall that uh, bodybuilding has been healthy for you? Like you're a healthy man now at 48, and you maintain your longevity, and you can thank bodybuilding for it and the lifestyle and the eating and everything yeah, else. I, 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 believe, I believe in taking care of myself first, you know? And I believe in going to, the, you know, that's, I'm still very strict about going to the gym, you know. I wake up every morning. I don't have to wake up every morning at 6 o'clock, you know. But I still wake up like if I was working and going in my business. And I'm still living that lifestyle. So I still wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, even if there's nothing to do here in this house. And I drink my coffee, I watch the news, and I go to the gym. I put myself first before anything. So, But even when you had your business... Those structures yes. that were your business and everything else surrounding uh, yes. involved with it, they never became shackles to you. You never, you never, you were oh, never. No, no, no. My business, my business was first in, in the sense that my business can't go down because of body. No, right, right. But, but I put that time in the morning at six o'clock that I has to, I had to wake up every morning at six o'clock or 530 in the morning. Right. Because right. at seven o'clock, I have to be at the gym. 
Right. And then be out by eight o'clock to go to work. So I, I've always put my gym in the morning. I, I've never been a fan of training after because I, after never finishes, like, you know, work never really finishes if you want to be successful. So for me, working out in the morning, I always put that as a priority. Like it's, it's always I'm, I'm been my read, priority. I'm going to read this in a second, but let me clarify because you've been very successful in what you've done. It's hard being successful, you know, in any chosen endeavor because most people quit. You've already established you don't stop, you don't quit. But what I'm saying is in my business, my purview, the people I deal with, so many of them, maybe they're successful on the extraneous, but they've lost themselves. You know, they either are really heavy or they just look terrible or they're, you know, their body, they're not thriving, their systems are shutting down, they're sick. And they yeah. lose themselves. Most people, most people, you know, way up there above 50%, they lose themselves. And, you know, they're always like, well, when I retire, I'm gonna do, you know, they're not, they're not gonna, they're gonna, that's how they end up. But that didn't happen with you. No, I mean, I'm not gonna tell you that I was perfect, but I, I'm never going to let myself gain weight. You know, I'm just I, that that's engraved in my head. Like, I'm not going to be I already yeah. look good for the rest of my life than to gain 40 pounds. Would you, you know, it, I, I, I always I not not your caliber at all. But I've always said with me, when I'm in shape, lean, I'm happiest, I'm most successful in business. I make the most money. My relationships are the best. You know, everything's optimal and it's directly proportional to the shape I'm in. Would you find that to be so? <laughs> Uh, I'm not necessarily like that, but I've always found that the gym has always taken care of everything for me. You know, if, if there's ever been a rough time in my life, the gym always took care of it. You know, oh, yeah. for example, when I broke my back, when I broke my back and I started doing my own therapy at the gym, it was the gym that saved me mentally, you know, um, I, 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 I don't want to say this and I'm going to say it because it's a little bit embarrassing, but right after I broke my back and I had my surgery and I recuperated, I literally fell again. You fell again? On the pool. Again. And I ripped my patella tendon off my kneecap. <laughs> wow, that, that, that's a bad injury. On my, on my pool. I had wow. to learn how to walk. That took me two years. Had the gym not been there, it took me two years to learn how to walk and let that pain go away. Um, I was wearing Crocs. The bottom of the shoe was wasted. My wife had already warned me to throw the shoes away, and I didn't throw them away because I'm a cheapo. So I put the shoes in the I put the shoes in the backyard. I'm just gonna wear these in the backyard when I go do work in the backyard. I'm cleaning the pool, and I slipped, broke my whole patella tendon off the bone. Pieces of the bone came off with it. That's how bad it was. Were you depressed? Were you depressed from that anytime after? Yeah, at that point, the back the back didn't get me depressed when I broke my patella yet. One thing on top of the other. I'm gonna try this right here. Mario Vidor Cucaliza, uh excellente entrevista con un gran campeón, muy inspiradora su historia de éxito. Saludos. Did I do okay there? Perfect. Saludos. Hi. Can you can you translate that? <laughs> what, what did I just say? No, I can't. <laughs> okay, sorry. Repeat it one more time. Repeat it one more time. Okay, excelente, entrevista, e n t r e v i s t a, con c o n un gran campeón. Maybe that's champion. C a m. Yeah, grand champion. You are a grand champion. Muy m u y, inspiradora, inspirational. Su, yes, yeah, un gran, yeah. Su historia de éxito, E X I T O. Yeah. Saludos, S A L U D O S. Hello and thank you. He says, "Um, your your grand champion and your story is fascinating, very motivating." And he's also going <laughs> to say next that uh, Dr. Deuce should not teach uh, Spanish as a second language. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you had those injuries. So, so now you've got two boys. You're married. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, got a business yeah. now. What's that? Do you have a business now? What are you doing now? Uh, Mike, I had a I had a non compete for three years. You know, um, oh. after so after I sold the business, and then I had to go through that back injury and um, the patella tendon tear. Um, when I sold the business, I I I, um, I invested. I'm going to say 60% of all the cash that I got into properties 
and stuff like that. So um, I'm, I cannot right. retire for a while, you know. Right. Good. Uh, but yeah, I found well, myself. Well, hey, listen, I've been injured too, and those injuries eat up a lot of time. You lose, you know. <laughs> Really, I, I've been there. You know? No, and you, and you question you you question yourself sometimes. Oh, yeah, you know? no, listen. So I went I went through those. You know, I went through that. You know, and then I'm like, okay, well, why do I need to work if I'm already okay? But what happened is, um, too much free time is not good. So I'm finding my way back into the fitness industry again, and and good. hopefully launching launching a brand again. Um, but I have I have properties that I that I manage. Well, there's not really that to manage. But um, so so, I'm I'm okay financially now. Good, you've got considerations, and you know that that's good. You're getting back into the game. It's what you like to do, and I think you know right. the industry needs a good guy like you because you know it's not always like that. And you got good ideas, and you've got a good perspective, and you've got two boys, and one of them's driving now. So you know you, <laughs> you gotta maybe you could develop a product to decrease stress. You know that's always a, <laughs> yeah. always a good concern. Yeah. Anything yeah. you want to add? Uh, actually, I want to do this little. I do this little thing at the end here. Uh, I've got some questions, and I'll ask you a question. You just tell me what comes to mind, or you know, maybe in a sentence or two. Um, what? So you've been in the industry. What is your go? If you had to choose one supplement, what's the best supplement? If you can only buy one supplement, what would it be? Ephedra. That <laughs> <laughs> damn Biden was the one that took that off the market. By the way, just so you know. Um, okay. Number two, Zane or Macaulay? Zane. 80s, Zane, 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 for sure. 80s bodybuilding or today's bodybuilding? No, 80s, man. Come on. Why do you say that? Because they were gods, man. Those, they, those guys were gods. They were statues. Walter Bennett, Walter Bennett wants to know if your son or sons are interested in bodybuilding. Unfortunately, we've kept them out of that world. <laughs> really? Yeah, we we um my wife didn't want any pictures of me in the house or trophies. Really? No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't I didn't want to either. You know, I I, I didn't want them to go through the drug use and steroids that you that go with it. Yeah, but you know, that's that's pretty substantial win, winning the team nationals. You threw your trophies out or you put them in No, 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 no. No, my my trophies I've always used them you know, for, for business and promotions. My wife you know, just kept them in a the closet. Like she hates them. She's like, why don't you just throw them away? They're ugly. And I'm like, you, no, you know, I, you know I, I sleep with my trophy every night. Yeah. Yeah. No and like, you know, so I tell her, I'm like, dude, this is, this is, this is what made me, you know, just like you have your plaque for new UM, you know, your diploma. This is, this is my diploma. You know, this is what made me, you know? And, and so I, you know, this podcast that I do, you know, everybody here is somehow related to the fitness industry. But we ordinarily talk more than 50 percent of the time uh, about things other than being on stage because we like to see what people have gotten from it and how it's it's made them better as far as their health and their life and their understanding of the world and their earnings and their relationships. And I think you you've nailed all of that. Um, and I have the last question here. Who runs your household? <laughs> me before you know but she's the smart one though <laughs> okay. life is balanced you know you've got the bronze. <laughs> Tony thank you Tony uh, listen, I, 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 I don't want to get you what I don't want to get you in trouble hey, hey is your wife a good cook what's your favorite meal by the way what's my favorite meal Man, I don't know. man, I've been eating chicken since I was fourteen and two. Man, I haven't. I don't think I've ever eaten anything else but that. Gotta be chicken. Uh, Mar Marjorie has a question. George, George, do you currently do TRT? That's a good question. Um. Yes. Very little. Very little. What are you doing? Like a CC of Cipionate a week? I do a, a one hundred milligrams every ten days, twelve days, fourteen days, whenever I remember. Okay. Do you ever get your bloods done? Do you know what your your level is? By any chance, no. Go by how you feel, right? At this point, yeah, it's, it's you know I've been I've been doing it so long. It's common sense. Hey, if you uh if you um wanted to compete again, you think you could do it? I know how, and I could, but my body's broken in half, so <laughs> it's not gonna. <laughs> I wouldn't you don't even want, try. You don't want to. But if my body was put, if my body was put together, 
Um, yeah, I, I could do it easily. It takes time. I wouldn't be able to do it in six months or a year. I would give myself three years because I know that's what it would take, you know. But then you, you know, you'd have to live in the garage because of your wife, you know. Ooh, oh yeah, I forgot about that part. Um, yeah, okay. no, I can't do that again, man. George. Okay, assuming assuming there was nobody around and it was just me, yeah, I could do it again. Well, I'm sure you could with your mindset. George, I really want to thank you. you. Have anything to add? We had a lot of people on here tonight. This was very successful. We disseminated a lot of good information, things I didn't know. Uh, anything you want to add or say or state or throw out there? Well, um, not much. I'm just happy that, you know, I'm, I'm still doing this, you know, after 35 years, you know, and I've never really quit. And um, I'm still going to continue to the day and that, you know. And like you said, um, I've, I've made this a priority in my life. And I remember the day I made it a priority in my life. I was actually in the water fountain. And I, I, I would see bodybuilders quitting after a few years, after 10 years of lifting weights, and they would look like crap after. And, I, and that day, I remember I was in the water fountain. I said, you know what? I'm never going to be one of those people. I'm going to do this to the day I die. Wait, wait, George. You, you remember this thought coming to your mind when you were at a water fountain? And you I, was, I was in the water fountain. Yeah, I remember clearly, and and I remember seeing, but you know, like guys that had quit bodybuilding, and then they would just stop lifting, and and that always bothered me. It's like, okay, you could stop competing, but why stop training? You know, I I think that's a really good point. Um, and I've always said this: if you win a show on June first, and you're you know you won Mister, you know Mister Georgia or whatever it might be, and then you're out of shape for the rest of the year, you're really not that champion anymore think about that right if you're not even yeah. close to look and there are guys who you would never even believe it and it's only three days out of the year and to me i don't know for longevity that there's not a lot of integrity there and i think th those types of fellas they don't really know why they're doing it but you you know you pretty much this has been emblematic of your entire life it's what you do it's who you are the day i die michael I mean, yeah. it's just it's in my oh. blood you know I'm glad I had you on here because what permeates, what comes across to me is you're, you're very resolute, meaning if you get something in your head, that's what builds America. In other words, if you, if you saw somebody else do something, I, I think like this too, if it was already done, that means the environment is fertile enough where you could plug yourself in and do it too. And here you're going into this, and there are people who will tell you, oh, the supplement industry has gotten really hard. I don't buy that. It's always hard. You're getting back in. <laughs> Oh, I was just thinking about that. I was just thinking about it a few weeks ago. Some people wanted to keep me out of it. Like, dude, why you want to get into that? It's so hard. And I'm like, yeah. I'm hearing negative stuff again. It was I did the same thing I heard 30 years ago. And with bodybuilding and with the gym and everything, everything is hard. There's nothing that's easy. And if you don't take that chance, you're never gonna go anywhere. Sure. You, know, you know, somebody's gonna tell you, hey, here, Georgie Betancourt, open another another uh, company. Oh, these are tough I'm times. I'm going to think I'm crazy. Or, you know what you tell them? These are tough times. Like, when the hell aren't they tough? It's always tough. What are you talking about? Come on. You know? Yeah, it's right? never been easy. No. It's never know, been easy. You know, Les Brown, one of my favorite speakers, and maybe we'll depart on this one. He says, if you do it as easy, your life will be hard. But if you do it as hard, your life will be easy. Les Brown was the man. That video changed my life. I listened no, to no, him when no. I was like 30. You know what I'm talking about. I watch that stuff right. every morning. I listened to him when I was like 13 or you know, 14 years old, and that video changed my life. Well, there, you know, listen, people think that that type of stuff is, you know, man, kind of esoteric and whatnot. But, you know, it's like Frank Zane, the year he first year he won the Olympia in 77, he had a mantra. Like every morning I wake up, I meditate, I relax, I have this little mantra. His was, I have already won. His, already goal, won, yeah. his goal was to chant, I think it was 2,700 times a day for the whole year. It was a million times. And yeah, maybe it's trivial to some people, but it's imprinting. And what happens is your words become your actions and it becomes who you are. Absolutely. And absolutely. Les Brown every single morning or Tony Robbins or whoever you want. And I'm not saying spend 10 grand to go to their seminar. I don't know if that's any good. But, you know, ultimately... That's you condition yourself to have no other outcome. Absolutely, absolutely. You got to cut all negativities from your life, man. You know when you when you're working towards a goal, you can't be around any. You know, I always say people who are negative, you clip you like a surgeon, you clip them like cancer from your life. Doesn't that sound horrible? Yeah. You don't yeah. want to be around that. I was telling my kid the same. I was telling my kid that the other day. I go, it might sound bad, but unfortunately, 
You do. <laughs> George, let me ask you with your kids, this is very important. Are you tough on them? In other words, in school, you have a certain standard. Because, you know, listen, anybody who's successful, they're successful because they have high standards. So with your kids, I mean, you brought them up to be respectful. They're not getting in trouble. They get good grades. You know, they they toe the line. Is that true, or you, you try? My, to I don't. I don't get involved in their school. My wife handles that because she's literally the brain here. Okay. Um, and I don't want my kids to follow in my footsteps because that creates too much pressure. I want them to whatever they decide to do to make sure they try. To, to make sure that they work towards being the best. And if you don't become the best, at least you got up here, you know? Right. Maybe the best is here, but at right. least they got here. So shoot to be the best at anything that you do. So I try to support that. Like, you know, hey, I don't care what you do, just make sure you're the best or try to be the best. That's excellent. Because, because if the best is here and you shoot for it and you get here, dude, that's, that's an accomplishment, you know? Thanks, thank, thanks for producing good kids because they'll pay Social Security and you and I will get some eventually. So, you know, <laughs> you got to put, put some good people into society. And I thank you for that. Hey, George, it's been thank a lot you. of fun. I really appreciate it. And uh, listen, we'll post this. I'll, I'll put this on your timeline and I hope to talk to you again. You know, maybe I'll hit you up, uh, you know, see how you're doing with your company and whatnot. And um, maybe you'll do some uh, longevity products that I'm, the route I'm going in. Uh, but thank you. We had a lot of people on here. Anything you want to say? Parting shot? That's it, Mike. <laughs> All right, George. Listen, we'll thank talk you. to you soon. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody, uh, tomorrow I have a uh, uh, Chef Andre Rush, biggest muscular arms in the world. Then we've got Rick Collins, the steroid lawyer for everybody. And if you're getting into a supplement company, you call Rick Collins. He keeps you straight. You may have dealt with him. And then we got Natural Olympia John Hansen on uh friday and we also have coming in the following weeks uh tom platz lou ferrigno and some other big time people oh so, excellent excellent, yeah, excellent. guys like you hey listen once once we got you on here george it's, it's a high bar for all these other guys you know <laughs> yeah well, right you know you were probably the best teenage bodybuilder ever so you know you can rest easy i, I mean you know thank but you thank, man thank you thank you george uh we'll talk to you soon everybody you have a good night thanks for being here we'll see you tomorrow thanks george peace Take care, man. Bye-bye.